Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Moda Aquatic Health Co Network webinar. We're going to be starting momentarily. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Model Aquatic Health Code Network webinar. My name is Daisy Galan. I'm a lead program analyst at the National Association of County and City Health Officials, NATO, and it's a pleasure to be here today and to be moderating today's webinar. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded, and we will share the recording along with the slides following today's events. Feel free to submit your questions using our Q&A box. And also, we will be able to answer them at the end of the webinar. The next slide, please. We will start with a presentation where we're going to hear about the provisional updates to CDC's model aquatic health code. So please feel free to interact with our speakers, as I mentioned, via Q&A box and we will save all our questions towards the end of today's sessions. I will now pass the word to Commander Joe Lako, Environmental Health Officer from CDC's National Center for Environmental Health to introduce today's speakers. Hi everybody, as Daisy mentioned, this is Joe Lako uh, from the National Center for Environmental Health at CDC. And I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Samaria. Uh, she comes to us from CDC's National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases. Uh, Samaria is an Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education, an ORISE. She's an ORISE fellow with the Healthy Swimming and Model Aquatic Health Code. She's worked on outbreak investigations of recreational water associated illness and collaborates with public health authorities in the aquatic sector to develop science-based prevention and control measures. She has her bachelor's degree in biological science with an emphasis in global health from the University of Georgia and a master's of public health degree in epidemiology from Temple University. Prior to joining Healthy Swimming, Samaria served in the Georgia Department, Georgia Department of Public Health's COVID-19 response. And Samaria has played an integral role uh, with CDC's uh, updating process to our MAC, our Model Aquatic Health Code. So Samaria, let's take it away. Thank you, Joe and Daisy for the introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, just so we're clear, I will just turn off my video so it can prevent any issues um, during the presentation, but here's my face and hello again. Okay, so um, as Joe said, I am an ORIS fellow with Healthy Swimming and the Model Aquatic Health Code uh, with the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch, uh, the CDC. And today I'm gonna be covering our provisional updates for the fourth edition Model Aquatic Health Code. Um, and just a reminder to everyone that these decisions, they still need to go through CDC clearance and they are subject to change. Can you go to the next slide? And before I go any further, I'd like to thank the Council for the Model Aquatic Health Code or CMAC. Thank your staff, your board of directors, 
the Technical Review Committee, the TRC, the Technical Support Committees, and your members. And with an extra special thanks to Dewey Case for all of his work on updating the Mac and also for being so responsive to our deluge of questions. Um, Susan Wickman for being the driving force and particularly with the vote for the co-conference and the change request library. And also thanks to Amanda Terrier for your incredible leadership with the TRC um, in reviewing the 530 change requests. Um, so thank you all for your help during this crazy process. And then for the CDC, I'd like to thank the team, Michelle Flafsa, Joe Laco, and Justin Rukiski, as we overcame the many hurdles this fourth edition threw our way. And they also will be joining me for the panel discussion. And then the rest from the CDC include Heather Huntley, Vince Hill, and Tessa Clemens. Next slide, please. Okay. And I'd like to start with a genuine appreciation for all of you, just for your patience um, during this cycle. To say that we've been busy would truly be an understatement. So we've had our team members away for four, one month, and one five month total response deployment. Uh, we've been working on the Healthy and Safe Swimming Week campaigns with 2021 focused on data on outbreaks that were associated with treated recreational water. Um, and these data, they were used to update the MAC Annex. And then for our 2022 campaign, um, where we will focus on preventing outbreaks that are associated with splash pads. And then in addition, we also have been assisting in multiple outbreak consultations, including the one in Texas. Um, we had Nigleria, Phalari, primary amoebic menin menin excuse me, meningoencephalitis, or a PAM case, that resulted in a prevention guidance for splash-associated PAM. And then also um, Michael Beach, who we call our godfather of healthy swimming. He transitioned from our emergency response to retirement and he left really big shoes to fill. So thank you again for your, uh, for your patience and um, your kindness during the cycle as we work through it. Next slide, please. And let's get started. So CMAC received a total of 530 change requests that have been considered by the TRC. And even though officially it says 530, some of the requests suggested many additional changes. So if you were to ask me, I'd say 530 plus change requests, um, but 90 of them were withdrawn and that left 521 change requests remaining. Next slide, please. And then from here on out, I'll be referring to change requests as CRs. Um, so for our CMAC, TRC and member voting, we saw that out of the 521 CRs, um, almost two thirds of the TRC, on the TRC, um, two thirds of the change requests were passed and 180 didn't pass. Um, and then we saw that 21 didn't pass or were not passed. And basically this means the TRC abstained. And then for the members, out of those same 521 CRs, we saw that the members passed almost two thirds of the CRs as well. And then 195 didn't pass. And we see that um, the TRC and the member voting were often similar, but there were two inconsistencies. Next slide, please. One being CR 492524-1. Um, and this one deletes the call for the pressure alarm system when the differential air pressure is not maintained in indoor chemical storage spaces. Um, so for this CR, we saw that the members and the board passed the CR but the TRC and CDC did not pass it. Um, so CDC's reasoning is being that everyone voted to not pass the CR 492457-1. And this CR, it called to delete the indoor chemical storage door alarm if the door is open for more than 30 minutes. So just for consistency's sake, we, um, we agree or we voted to not pass this CR. Next slide, please. And then the other inconsistency was CR 573112-1. Um, and this one suggested adding the CY, CYA DPD FC ratio to not exceed 20 to one. For this one, TRC passed it, but the members, the board and CDC did not. Uh, we had multiple conflicting CYA CRs that were submitted by the CMAX Sanguric Acid Ad Hoc Committees um, on, chlor on chlorine stabilizers. So um, next slide, please. So then for the CMAC board and CDC voting, 
we found that the board voted in agreement with TRC and members for almost all of its ERs. And then there were only eight, they did not vote in agreement with TRC and the members. And then for CDC, out of those 521 CRs, we voted um, almost 95% of the CRs we voted in agreement with TRC members and the board. And we only had 30, but we didn't vote in agreement with TRC members and the board. Next slide, please. So the MAC was designed to basically promote healthy and safe swimming for everyone in the United States. Um, and to also to improve our protective public health practices. And we're really proud that our fourth edition has had a lot of what we call public health wins. Um, our biggest ones for this edition include editorial edits, um, secondary treatment, which I'll explain later, um, a new EndNote references library, um, cyanuric acid as a closure item, water death for starting platforms, and a lower water pH minimum. Next slide, please. So starting with our editorial changes, um, we're well aware that MAC is a very lengthy document. Um, so uniformity across both the annex and the code, it was a big goal for us for this edition. Um, we made many editorial changes that contributed to shortening the MAC and making it easier for readers to digest. Um, just starting with uh, the text that preceded the code in the annex, we sync the foreword, the acknowledgements, the abbreviations, the terms, and the cited codes and standards. And then in addition to that, we also move the preface and introduction and the user guide to the MAC website with the link included right there. And then throughout the document, um, there are multiple CRs that cleaned up vague and inconsistent language, like proper uses of a barrier versus an enclosure, um, secondary treatment, and chlorine related terminology. And there are also were CRs that suggested standardizing language or referencing the local, state, territorial, federal, or tribal laws, because there were some inconsistencies um, with that throughout the document. Next slide, please. Okay, and then with CRs 47-3321-2 and 47-3322-2, um, these CRs, they cover log inactivation and installation, and they promote bather health. Um, however, due to the inconsistency between either secondary disinfection treatment, secondary treatment systems, and secondary disinfection system, CDC standardized the use of um, secondary treatment as a whole, and this was done to encourage an advancement of bather health. So future CRs now, they can potentially call for better um, filters to remove the pathogens thanks to these CRs. Next slide, please. And then CDC voted to pass multiple CRs that addressed any inconsistency in language um, as addressed earlier. And also this one in particular led to a standardized term for safety rope, safety float rope, float line, and then any other variation we had uh, or that we saw into just rope and float line as it was defined in CR 32-31. Um, and this new definition, it matches with international swimming pool and spa code definition. And the same Kobe, um, the MAC, it strives to achieve consistency with it. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, this was one win that I'm very proud of. Uh, so we've created and updated our reference library in EndNote, and it was an unexpected challenge that was, that was tedious, but it will allow for future additions to be edited more smoothly. Um, so when we started, we had two separate libraries that consisted of over 650 references. Um, and these had to be cleaned at any repeated sources and then reorganized. And then after all that cleaning, our finished library now has approximately 400 references and these excluded any repeated ones. Um, and then additionally, let's see, we also, or CDC voted to remove the alphabetical list of references to shorten the document length and to only list references in order of appearance. So an example would be that um, you could see a 2018 report on drowning reference as number 38, only as number 38 um, throughout the MAC because it was the 38th reference cited. And then next slide, please. 
And then CR 6631-3 was a big feat since it established cyanuric acid as a closure item. Um, CDC did not pass the statement here um, on disinfectant residual minimums, but we did vote to pass the addition of CYA DPD FC ratio exceeding 45 to one as an imminent health hazard that required immediate correction or closure. And then prior to this, um, there weren't consequences for not following the MAC guidance. We'll go to the next slide. Here. And then with the starting platform CR 4832, um, it proposed increasing the depth with starting blocks from four feet to six feet. And it was originally approved by CMAC for new construction and substantial alterations, but CDC did revise this so that it applies solely to new construction. Next slide, please. And so the second CR for 57341, it covers water pH. And CDC passed the CR to lower the pH minimum from 7.2 to 7.0. But aquatic venues, they can still operate at their current levels um, if they still fall within the recommended range. And we marked this as a huge step forward from a previous cycle. You see here in the screenshot where the proposed minimum was 6.8. And also we know that we know that lowering this pH, it will increase the disinfection effectiveness. So this is um, something great for us. Next slide, please. Okay, and then next I will cover CDC's voting patterns for CRs that we, that we passed. Um, and with the first theme, we saw that this was for those which the CDC or which the MAC made more clear and improve public health. These are more likely to be accepted by the CDC. Um, next slide, please. An example would be with coping. We saw us with CRs 4514-4-1 and 4514-5-1. Um, not only did these CRs specify horizontal overhang and vertical thickness, but they also corrected the metric convergence for an easy comprehension. So you're starting with, instead of seeing 50 millimeters and kind of guessing, you're more familiar with seeing it in centimeters. So you see five meter, centimeters and you're like, okay, check. Um, next slide, please. And then we also saw that um, when the TRC abstained, CDC also did not pass the CR because uh, we're more inclined to pass CRs when the TRC, the members and the board had already passed it as well. But there were a few exceptions. If we go to the next slide. Um, so for the exceptions were like CRs that were good ideas and they promoted public health, but this required further development. We can go to the next slide. Starting with CR 4822-4-1, for example, um, this CR proposes a change to the design of access for tall diving platforms. And you read the language, you know, it does minimize the risk of falls and the severity of any associated injuries. Um, these are MAC goals, but um, the additions do require further development and need to be more enforceable. Um, so we'll be seeing that in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, CDC also didn't vote to pass CRs that contradict the MAC. Uh, next slide, please. So the MAC focuses on public aquatic venues, that's known. Um, and when redefining an aquatic venue, like with CRs 32-26 and 32-28, um, we see these below. So the first CR passed, um, but CD did not, CDC did not pass it. And with the second one, it did not pass and CDC agreed um, so that the MAC would only focus on public aquatic venues. If you see the screenshots here, um, we see it in the top, they're replacing the general public with a person or people. And then on the bottom for 32-28, they are replacing the general public with just humans. Um, and by doing this, the MAC definition um, could potentially include backyard and residential pools, which is not our focus. Next slide, please. And then we also see that with multiple C um, CRs as listed here, for construction permit, permits, um, they call for the complete deletion of text. Uh, so the first text, the first CR listed 
which is 4153-2. This did pass. It was passed by the TRC, the member in the board votes. Um, and then the TRC member in the board vote voted not to pass the other two, 4154-1 and 4155-1. Um, and then just for consistency, CDC voted not to pass CR 4153-2, which is on top. Uh, and we see that in the next update cycle, uh, we will recommend this revisiting permit language in both chapters four and five, just to ensure that they are complete, consistent, and that chapter four and five do complement each other. Next slide, please. Okay. And then finally, uh, CDC didn't pass CRs when the change no longer applied following editorial edits. Next slide, please. And some examples of these would be that um, CDC voted not to accept the CRs that called for the deleting of abbreviations and cited codes and standards. Um, so this was done since CDC synced our listed abbreviations and our cited sources and standards between the code and the annex, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and some of them are moved were moved to um, the website. And we see that for the fifth edition, um, CDC, we will submit a CR to have one list of abbreviations, terms, and cited codes and standards for the MAC overall. Next slide, please. Okay. And then our tentative timeline for the MAC release will be that in February, we'll submit it into clearance, CDC clearance this week. Um, and then April, we're expecting for the code to clear the code in the annex through three CDC centers and three CDC offices. And that by June, we will have the fourth edition map published on the CDC website. And just reminds us all tentative. Um, next slide, please. And then for future, for the future, um, some of our next steps include revisiting exempting single pass splash pads. Um, also developing recommendations for surf venues, artificial lagoons, tall platforms, and also updating the annex as a whole. Um, another would be standardizing the use of aquatic venue versus pool, then also safety. And then also to define shallow water versus deep water. And then we're thinking also to possibly address raised curves at splash pads um, and plumbing thermometer for heated pool water and then defining how to measure aquatic venue width. Next slide, please. And that's all, thank you for your time. If you do have questions and wanna contact us, our emails are here on the slide, but then I, I think we're transitioning into our Q&A section now, but CDC would like to first um, hear from the audience. Um, after seeing this presentation and kind of getting a, an overview of our updates, how can we make this process better. Thank you so much, Samaria, for your presentation and for clarifying so many of the questions that we have here. So um, we will now move on to our Q&A portion of today's webinar. So as a reminder for everyone, you are welcome to use our Q&A box uh, to provide us comments and also uh, had to answer the question that Samaria posed to everyone. Uh, if there are ways that you would like to see uh, how this process can be improved, uh, we'll love to hear from you as well. So, okay, so we start, um, with a, a logistical question here. Um, will this, the updated version of the Mac, will this be published solely online or will we have access to hard cop uh, copies of this as well? Hi, this is uh, Joe at CDC and we will publish that online uh, in a PDF format and it is uh, downloadable and can be prepared uh, as needed by uh, the general public or any jurisdictions. Okay. 
Thank you, Jill. Um, related to related our to next event, when are those expected to take place, specifically the shallow water versus the deep water uh, depth in the Amex? Do you guys have a timeline on that? So, so this is Michelle from CDC, and um, I don't have a timeline for a lot of this. I think, you know, in going through the 530 change requests, um, it was just ideas that that occurred to us along the way in the review process. Um, CRs that 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 didn't quite pass, or um, ideas that were floating around there, and things that came that came in. I, I do think CDC and CMAC has have both made a commitment to get artificial lagoons and surf venues up and running. Um, there are there was a draft of the CRs, not finished drafts of CRs, but committees have met. So I'd like to see that finished off first. Um, and I do think if I'm understanding correctly and, and, and those participating, um, please, please weigh in, um, you know, on the chat or whatnot. Um, I get the impression that the annex is really what most of the, what most of um, our state and local partners are using day to day more than anything. And I would like to see that updated. In my mind, those are the three priorities in terms of definitions and and stuff and maybe reworking um, you know, the tall platforms or actually further developing the tall platform CR. And um, I, I think, you know, that's, I mean, I could see that happening. I just, I think we have to have a bigger discussion on what our priorities are. I mean, this is a group effort and I, I wanna hear what our state and local public health partners would like to prioritize. Maybe that list didn't capture what you're thinking. So um, I'd like to hear more on that. Chat away in the box. Thank you, Michelle. As we are waiting for uh, those comments to come through uh, our Q&A box, um, there are some questions here about local health departments and how local health departments first um, the expectations behind using this updated version of the Mac and how local health departments can really use it as a best practice um, if it's likely to change again, you know, in the next two years. So as we're like catching up to implement the updated version, knowing that an, a, a new version will come in soon. Um, so for our members here, I think that's a really important uh, discussion that I would love to hear from uh, CDC's team. Yeah, this is Joe. Uh, I'll take this the first crack at this uh, question. Uh, I think it's really largely going to be dependent on the review cycle that each jurisdiction has uh, for updating their codes. Uh, there are some codes out there that haven't been uh, updated in decades. Uh, some rely on their states to provide uh, the swimming codes and at the local level is where the enforcement takes place. Uh, so it's really important to try to get an understanding of how those uh, regulations are updated. And then the MAC can be used as a tool, as is mentioned in the question, as uh, a format of best practice. And I like to uh, advise folks to take a look at the MAC and the easiest way to uh, take advantage of it is to use it to fill the holes that aren't in your code. Uh, sometimes it's easier to insert uh, new language for something that's not in your code already than it is to make a, even a slight adjustment to something that's already uh, in the books. So identifying uh, where there are gaps based on needs, based on outbreaks and injuries and historical data in your jurisdiction, you know, can the MAC or does the MAC address any of those needs? And can some of the guidance in there be incorporated into the updated process? Joe, um, also wanted to add for those who are attending the webinar, we'll share the link here with you in a minute. Um, Nature worked very closely with two local health departments um, about a year or two ago on how 
uh, truly uh, go through the process of implementing the MAC and updating their local pool codes. And uh, that is, uh, we have an article that we wrote about this and hopefully sharing those best practice with you would also help those who are interested in knowing what other jurisdictions are doing, how they are approaching this um, in ways and resources that uh, you can have access to. So we will be including those in the chat for everyone as well. Um, yeah, that article that Daisy just mentioned has two different perspectives in it. One is from a local jurisdiction that creates their own aquatics codes. And one is from a local jurisdiction that relies on their state health department to provide the codes and that they are the ones that do the permitting and the enforcement. So as uh, some of the comments are coming through here in our Q&A box, um, I think uh, our attendees would like to know as we talk about you know, ways to improve the process, um, what part of the entire uh, MAC uh, revision process or the CMAC revision process you are referring to, there's a specific area that would like input. Um, we'll uh, love to clarify that for our attendees. I know partially we were curious as to CDC's um, communications and involvement with it. If you had any um, comments about that as well. Michelle, Joe, did you hear or did you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, I, 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 I this is Michelle, and I, I do want to add, I think a lot of us in the process came into this without any notes or any, any policies or procedures in place. Um, I know Dewey stepped in to his position as technical director at CMAC, I believe like February of 2020. Um, I stepped in to take Michael's place while he was in EOC and then eventually retired. But none of us had an instruction manual or how this was done or, or whatever. And I know, I know the whole pandemic threw a wrench into things, but any feedback on, on how we can do better um, would be really helpful. Um, we have some ideas at CDC, but we definitely, you know, would like to hear back from our, our, our state and local partners again in this chat or, or email Joe or I or Samaria or Justin um, and, and, and let us know. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious as to what we can do better. I know, we, I know all of us have agreed here at CDC that we're gonna write what we learned, lessons learned protocols um, along the way at, once we get the MAC into clearance here at CDC. Um, we don't want the next group, should we all get hit by a bus, not to be kind of left where, where we were in, in a lurch. Thank you, Michelle. Um, there are some questions here in the chat related to the closure criteria um, addition. And uh, there are a few comments here. Uh, and Joe and Michelle, do you, do you like to clarify or is there anything you like to um, add related uh, to the closure criteria for our attendees? Well, if you... You have to carefully read uh, the, the two big CYA changes that are in this back. And uh, one of them is the upper limit. So it doesn't really address a lower limit, a minimum for CYA, but the max is based on the EPA, EPA's uh, exposure assessments for uh, exposures to CYA that result in uh, negative human health effects. And the 45 to one ratio is already implied in the MAC uh, when looking at the 90 parts per million uh, operating limit and the ideal uh, two parts per million chlorine. So that ratio of 90 to two equates to 45 to one and that's where those are derived from. Uh, 
And there's a question here too, also in the Q and A about uh, facilities that utilize a, a puck for a chlorinator, uh, so an erosion tablet that already has CYA in it, and how that is going to uh, impact uh, regulating and keeping track of your CYA levels uh, when you're using those types of erosion feeders. That's a really great question and uh, a very, I think, complicated one and challenging one to try to answer here in, in just a couple of minutes. But uh, yes, the, the CYA doesn't uh, degrade and it stays in the water and it does accumulate over time if it's continu continuously added. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, as we're talking about um, this topic, uh, the next question asks is, will there be any change to chlorination requirements for water quality due to SARS-CoV-2 in pools during swim class in use? So, so CDC is not aware of any data that says um, that the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus can be spread in the water we swim in. Whether we're talking a pool where you have the extra barrier of chlorine, or you're talking about a lake, um, what I what I would say is I think when we're talking about swim lessons, we're not really talking about the water itself. We're talking about sharing air between the instructor and and the student. And I'm not sure how that is changed or or fixed or addressed. Um, Instructors need to be close to the students. Um, we don't want students drowning in swim lessons. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, we don't want students not taking uh, swim lessons. Um, one of the things we're concerned at here, I mean, when we were at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, having swim schools shut down for a few weeks, although a financial burden, we didn't think was a public health burden in terms of um, drowning, um, drowning prevention, but. I mean, to put swim lessons on hold for two years, um, I, I think is a very different story. I'm, I'm not sure how we make that better. Um, the, we can't wear masks in the water and um, I, I think we're a little stuck there. What I will say is we are encouraged by the fact that, um, that the numbers are going down nationally. So I do think, you know, the activities that, you know, the the activities that we've seen before, the mitigation measures that we've seen, um, I, I think we're gonna see uh, CDC as the numbers go down, um, you know, walk back some of the some of some of its recommendations. That being said, there is a variant out there right now, um, an Omicron variant that that might change the change the picture of what we're seeing across the country. So I think, you know, I, I think we just need to see and wait and, and look at what's going on in our communities at the time and, and go from there. Thank you, Michelle. Our next question is asking um, if you are going to try to incorporate some of OSHA's workplace safety items into uh, the uh, possibly, do you know, the next version of the Mac? So, so I believe that question's from Lauren. Lauren, I, I'm not aware of any efforts to do so, but if you feel like this is something um, a committee needs to take on, I, I would reach out to, to Dewey Case at CMAC. If this is an issue of just a couple CRs that, that need to be, I would, I would, I uh, I would suggest that you um, submit them for the next um, update cycle and, and see where they go. Thank you, Michelle. Um, there is a comment here uh, going back to um, local food codes and how it is hard to enforce this without an ordinance or a code and how local health departments are able to educate around this. Um, and we really appreciate this comment um, and we will uh, share the link with you. As I mentioned, Nisha is working very closely with CDC to try to support 
best our local health departments as they go through this process. Um, so we do have some resources to share. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us if there's any way that we can support your local jurisdiction directly, but we would encourage you to definitely read the stories that we share from our members and how they were able to work either with their state or with their local jurisdiction to try to get those local food codes updated. Um, our, my colleagues from CDC, is there any other comments or recommendations that you have they would like to share with our local health departments who are here? Yeah, I think it's important to understand that the, the MAC is a CDC guidance document. It's not uh, an enforceable set of codes. CDC doesn't make laws. Uh, we are not an enforcement agency. Uh, this is a tool, a robust tool, uh, that we hope that local and state jurisdictions and other organizations will use this when they're updating or building their own laws, their own enforceable uh, set of rules that do need to be followed. So I, I've seen a couple comments in the in the Q and A box that you know said, well, just because the Mac says it doesn't mean it's enforceable. That, that's true. What is enforceable and what I think is uh, critical for operators and uh, pool owners to understand is that they do need to follow their local and state codes uh, and what is pertinent to their jurisdictions because that is what is going to be uh, inspected and assessed by your uh, health officials, and that is what is going to be enforceable. Thank you, Joe. Um, one of the questions that we received here is how can um, our attendees spread the word on the uh, MAC, uh, specifically to aquatic professionals? It would be great if everyone um, in pool management knew about the MAC. Um, I will start by saying, um, please definitely uh, go to our webpage. We specifically have uh, great webinars and resources to share. Um, and uh, before I pass the word also to Joe and his team to share, because there are many great things that they also can uh, recommend to those attending, um, I would say I was saving this announcement towards the end, but I uh, would like to say that Nature is working in collaboration with CDC and we're putting together um, very short trainings. Uh, this should be no longer than 20, 25 minutes to do exactly as you're asking uh, here about how to educate them. Those will be available. Um, also the slides will be available to download so you can either uh, provide them with the recording of the training or share the training yourself using the slides. Uh, but those are uh, ways that we're trying to break this down and think about creative ways that you guys can also use this to educate um, aquatic health professionals out there. So uh, Joe and your team, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add as well. This is Michelle. So for our, for our state partners, at least, I, I would like to give a shout out um, to the CMAC state designee group. Um, I, I see that as a potential, you know, forum where we can start sharing lessons learned um, and, and developing, um, developing items. I mean, I kind of look at when, when I see C CDC's role, it's not so much to, to, it's not, you know, to come up with um, this is the way we're doing it, and these are our priorities. And this is the way we're going forward. I, I see that as an, I see this more as an opportunity to say, okay, what are your needs? It's a lot easier for for us here at CDC to develop it one time, and for our individual local partners, all three thousand plus of them, and our fifty state partners, to take what we develop here instead of looking at a blank screen, to take it and further develop it and and, and adjust it and make it their own and. And so, you know, if there are MAC adoption tools that you would like CDC to develop or CMAC to develop, 
I think I think it'd be good to start those conversations. And I do I do think that perhaps um, the the CMEX state designee call would be a good would be a good opportunity um, where adopters can talk about what adopters can work about can talk about what helped them and share their lessons learned and those who are in the adoption process or um, considering adoption, um, you know, can say, hey, here are my needs. It's a lot easier for us to develop a checklist or, or whatever the might, case might be once here and then you all adjust it as needed, like I said. Thank you, Michelle. Um... It would be great to know if you guys could touch upon when the next updated uh, cycle in the submission for the CR request would begin. So I believe that the CMAC has been um, has been in in um, talks about starting that this fall, but I'm not sure if Dewey is on and, and maybe could put something in the chat, but I believe it was for this fall to start. It's approaching quickly. Too soon. We just we're just finishing yeah. up. So we're on three year cycles now. And uh, before when it was just two year cycles. Wow, that was just nonstop. Yeah, I see Dewey's comment here. Thank you, Dewey, for being on. Um, yes, either fall or uh, January of 2023. So uh, a big uh, shout out to everyone in the CMAC at CDC for being a no ending cycle as you're completing one and then just getting started with another one. So that's great. Um, I think we're reaching some of the end here with our questions. Um, there is an interesting question here asking about uh, from Jacqueline. So when you're going through the updates, have you thought about reviewing local full codes from selected jurisdictions? So using that information maybe to compare with known outbreaks and enforcement capabilities at those jurisdictions. Um, Joe and Michelle, I know there have been some studies related to outbreaks, but I, I'm not sure if that has actually been compared to uh, local pool codes or even use of the MAC. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, we largely re uh, rely on the change request process uh, to make additions, deletions, or updates uh, to the next version of the Mac. And a lot of those do come from the ever uh, progressing science and the ever uh, growing amount of information and data that we have regarding outbreaks and safe pool operations. Um, we do try to stay ahead of the game and try to address uh, novel and new and emerging trends in aquatics, uh, particularly with different types of venues. Uh, we try to put some kind of guidance out there before uh, the new and novel venues become so widespread and there's a whole bunch of states and a whole bunch of counties and cities looking around thinking we don't have anything to regulate or anything on how to think about these new types of places. So um, I would encourage folks to get involved with the CMAC and be part of the process. Uh, you guys have always done a really good job of that over the years and uh, we count on your input. Thank you, Joe. As you're talking about that, um, and I know we don't we don't have Dewey here with us, but can uh, for people to get involved in submitting their change requests, I know everyone can submit a change request and get involved, but. Um, how they can be more actively participating on that and uh, knowing you know, when those requests uh, or call for requests are open. Um, I, we can refer them to the CMAC, but if you wanna mention anything uh, to those who are attending here as well. Uh, 
I would say too, to similar uh, messaging and communications that you saw uh, for notifying you about things like this webinar. Uh, we use uh, communication and listservs and try to reach a wide net to a wide audience, not just with our center, but also um, in Michelle and Samaria Center. And we try to uh, also have some of that messaging go out through our, our partners as well, whether it's NATO or NEHA or CMAC. So I uh, would keep your, keep your eyes open. We'll definitely be sending out some messaging uh, when the CR process for the fifth edition uh, opens up. Yes, and as Joe mentioned, uh, if you're not part uh, of uh, our listserv as well, our Mac network listserv, um, we will include the link here in the chat for everybody um, in, in our follow-up email as well. So you can join our, uh, uh, our listserv as well because we will be sharing more information uh, as they become available as well with other information thrown via available CDC newsletters as well. Um, the next question here, Michelle, is for you from Thomas asking about the one discrepancy between the MAC and EPA regulation is the max limit on available chlorine, the 10 PPE in the MAC versus the 4 PPE in EPA. Has there been any progress on this issue? Sorry, I was on mute. I'm glad, um, I'm glad we were able to get to this question. So yeah, that has been an ongoing thing here at CDC for, for a good few months now. Um, you know, when we were reviewing uh, the CRs, I did go to CDC's Office of General Counsel to ask about this, um, to get specifically, you know, our, we have multiple states that, that say that the limit is 10 parts per million. Uh, the, the MAC says this, but the, then the EPA label says this. And I can say preliminarily, the Office of General Counsel at EPA is telling the Office of General Counsel here at CDC that that, that, that label might not, that, that they're not regulating the chlorine max for pools. Now, they have not really given us anything, you know, specifically in writing that we, that, that you know, the four PPM max on labels that we see is, is gone, um, but we're trying to get further clarification on that. We're, we're hearing multiple things from EPA, so we, we do want, we do want um, some clarity on that. We are asking for that. Thank you, Michelle. Um, there is a comment and a question from Michael um, saying that the MAC presents the current best practice and that he appreciates the constant updates based on the latest science and findings. Would it be possible to provide some guidance on how urgent, uh, urgent change should be adopted in the local enforceable codes? That's, that's a really difficult question to answer uh, just because of the variability from jurisdiction to jurisdiction on how codes are updated, how new information is inserted into codes to address a need. Uh, that's really gonna need to be addressed on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis uh, with close coordination between uh, local health departments and the local legislatures, they're the ones that are uh, writing the codes and getting those passed uh, for later enforcement. The hope is, is, is that the MAC can be used uh, when there's questions about what should the limit be or how often should this happen or what kind of materials do I need? And the MAC hopefully can provide those answers for you. Thank you, Joe. Um, so 
there is a question here going back when we are talking about the closure criteria and what is included in the MAC. Um, I, I want to ask uh, Joe and Michelle if you have anything else to add. Does this mean that you know this will be updated to no longer specify that these are the imminent health hazards, or is there anything else that you want to add related to that? Yeah, I, I'm, I, I've read that uh, a couple of times. So, so Jennifer, if you can reach out to me after after this webinar, and I will. So I understand your question thoroughly, and also Mike Beatty, if if you can reach out to me, um, I wasn't sure what your question was, and then once we have your questions, Joe and I and Samaria and Justin can put an answer together and send it out to Daisy and our colleagues at NATO, so the whole group gets an answer. Okay, so we, uh, we're about uh, three minutes away and uh, before we close, uh, we do have some announcements, but I mean, I wanna close maybe with a last question here from Robert. Uh, he's asking about the current CYA test generally used in our area is very subjective. I will be hesitant to close a facility based on that test. What is the status of the test kit industry on having available on economical and relative accurate tests uh, uh, for the CYA. Um, Joe and Michelle, do you have anything to comment on Robert's question? Well, I think what the, the question is for the, the CYA upper limit um, being part of the uh, intimate health hazards. and. Uh, you're correct. If, if you're going to be measuring for that, you do need to ensure that the range of your testing equipment is adequate to get that type of uh, accurate reading. So if you're, the range on a test is only 1 to 10, and you need to figure out if it's over 20, um, then you don't have the right uh, piece of equipment or the right measuring tool to make an accurate um, estimation of, of what the chemical level is. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, we want to say a big thanks to all our panelists. Before everyone drops off, I just want to make a quick announcement. As we mentioned, we are working in putting together some quick heat trainings uh, based on some priority topics in the MAC, and we'd we'll love to hear from you We'll add here to the chat and we we'll include in our follow-up email. It's a very quick survey, five-minute survey, just to get priority topics that you'll be interested in having this uh, ready available trainings that you can take or you can actually apply yourself uh, at your jurisdiction. So please uh, complete this. We would love to hear from you. Also, as a reminder, uh, this webinar was recorded and we'll be sharing the recording in the slides with you in a follow-up email. With that, I truly want to thank everyone. Thank you for all your questions. If you have any questions that were not answered today, please feel free to email us and we'll be happy uh, to answer your question to directly to one of our panelists. Thank you, everyone. And this concludes today's webinar. Have a great rest of your day.